This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. It's time for the FTPCB Summer Playhouse. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife Three Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So we're now in the middle of summer. Yes. And the TV broadcast networks have brought out their summer series. Mm-hmm. They're like mini series or ongoing that reappear each summer, along with more reality and game shows. Yes. Some mm-hmm. of the shows that are out there ABC has The Whispers, this mm-hmm. spooky thing, Astronaut Wives Club. Yes. Uh, we have Mistresses coming back, Rookie Blue coming back. Celebrity Family Feud, and BattleBots coming back for a second time from the 90s. Yes. CBS has The Briefcase, Under the Dome, Extant, both coming back, Zoo, and the perennial Big Brother. Although Extant has been changed quite a bit. Apparently. Yeah. Not that we're going to watch the second season of that. (laughs) NBC has The Island, Aquarius, Welcome to Sweden, Amazingly coming back for a second season. Mm -hmm. And I can do that. We have on Fox, Wayward Pines, and boom! Not quite so much summer programming on Fox. No. So the broadcast networks traditionally closed up shop on Memorial Day, returning on Labor Day. Essentially putting out a sign saying, gone fishing, we're done. (laughs) They really just showed reruns. And in a way, that was kind of nice for some viewers. Back then... You know, 20 years ago, we didn't have these serialized stories. So if you missed a show, you could catch it in reruns during the summer. And you didn't have a thousand different ways to get it. Yes. If you you missed it when it was on, you might have caught it in a rerun, and that was the only Only way you were ever going to get it. ever going to see it. Right. And they kind of gave up during the summer because they had no competition. There was kind of a gentleman's agreement among the networks of, okay, nobody put on anything new. (laughs) But people didn't really watch as much television during the summer. So... It took them years to realize that cable, and now the internet, Mm -hmm. was eating their lunch. (laughs) There was now competition. Yeah, because what they've now found is a great deal of the audience goes to cable in the summer, and then some of them never come back to to traditional broadcast. So, however, there are some examples of what were then called summer replacement shows. Mm Mm-hmm. Early television used the summer to burn off failed TV pilots. <laughs> so it was not good enough to bring up uh, in our schedule, but it's good enough for the summer. Yeah. In programs such as CBS Summer Playhouse and Vacation Playhouse. But don't you wish they did that now sometimes? I really wish they did. And in fact, some networks have actually tried, some cable networks have tried to kind of bring this up. There was... Uh, I don't know if Trio is still around. I think it's gone. They probably rebranded 15 times. But at one point, they were taking failed TV pilots and showing them as an ongoing mm-hmm. concept. So then in the late 60s and the early 70s, there were a number of variety shows that didn't translate well into reruns or the stars didn't allow reruns in their contracts. Right. They said, no, you're not showing this a second time. So the networks ended up with a lot of slots to fill, because there used to be a lot of variety shows, mm-hmm. so summer variety replacements were created. These were designed to run during what was then a very short period between seasons. Keep in mind, in the early days of television, some shows ran 40 weeks of new episodes mm-hmm. a year. Yeah. And then it got whittled down to about 26 in the 60s, and that yes. continued up and through about the 80s. And now you're lucky to get 20. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the idea was to get a show that was either A, good, but not too good, because you didn't want to annoy the regular show's hosts, Uh the stars that had their regular fall shows, or B, good enough to become its own regular series, kind of a stepping stone. Right. Dean Martin had a long-running variety show from 65 all the way to 74, although by 74 he was basically had morphed it into the the man-of-the-hour roasts format. And his company produced a number of summer replacement shows. Mm -hmm. Ronan Martin got their first shot in 1966 in a summer replacement show. They were a big hit, and of course they later got Mm Laugh-In. In In 1968, a 1930s themed show was created kind of based on old Broadway and, and movie theater 
musicals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was called The Gold Diggers. And some of those girls ended up as, oh, the ding a ding girls, the ding a ding sisters coming on in a day uh, on Dean's show. So we then had the Bobby Darren Amusement Company. And a lot of these shows had just goofy names. Names, yeah. <laughs> in 1972. He actually got a second summer season in 73, but he died soon after that yeah. second season. Dean Martin's Comedy World, 1974, presented comedy acts from around the globe. Clips from Monty Python were shown, their first appearance in the United States. Yeah. And the show, the production company, converted the show, the Python shows, from UK's PAL format, which is a separate format. This is all gone because of digital now. But in the analog days, it was a completely incompatible format to what you saw in the U.S., which allowed those shows to be easily sold to PBS later. Yep. So, Dean Martin was indirectly responsible for Monty Python's success. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> Replacement shows often came from someone with a top 40 hit at the time. Yes. Many of which became one-hit wonders. Yeah. So, here are some of those shows. The Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour in 1971, which started as a summer replacement for the venerable Ed Sullivan show, was such a hit, they got a regular series, along with later a divorce, and later separate series. Mm -hmm. And when they split up, their replacement was Tony Orlando and Don 1974, classic example of a one-hit wonder. Later tried to run the show during the regular season, which was also a pattern it didn't survive. I remember watching Sonny and Cher and Tony Orlando. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. The Jerry Reed, When You're Hot, You're Hot Hour, 1972, based on his one hit. Yeah. <laughs> a replacement for the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. Glenn got his start on the Smothers Brothers as a summer replacement back in 68. I can't say I remember either Jerry Reed or I know who Glenn Campbell was, but I, I remember don't think I watched his show. I remember watching the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour because that had become a... Like a regular fall series. Uh huh. The Ken Berry Wow Show, 1972. Mary Berry RFD had just been canceled despite being yeah. in the top 20, and this is all because of the Rural Purge, yes. which was this concept where CBS had the hugely high ratings. And then these uh, demographers came in. And said, you're not getting the right audience. You're getting old rural audiences that don't spend money. Mm -hmm. So they cleared out all their rural shows. <laughs> that was referred to as the Rural Purge. And so Bear Bear RFD was just one of those shows that got cut out. So he needed a job fast. Because <laughs> he was like, you know, I'm going to have the next season. You know, I have a certain standard of living. What, I don't have a job anymore? Yes. <laughs> Joey and Dad, 1975. I wish I had seen this. A summer replacement for Cher's solo show after they got divorced. Uh-huh. <laughs> a bizarre concept. Joey Heatherton, Bob Hope regular, and showgirl, along with her real dad, Ray, who was on a 50s kids show <laughs> as a variety team. Okay. Now, here's the weird part. At one point, Monty, again, Monty Python, the dead parrot sketch was read almost verbatim by Pat Paulson from the Smothers Brothers and Sherman Hemsley of the Jeffersons. Okay, that might have been interesting. <laughs> it ran for four whole weeks, and then it was replaced. So you actually replaced a summer replacement by the Manhattan Transfer 1975, a jazz singing quartet, which also flopped in four weeks. Okay. Cher supposedly blames those two shows' failure to force her to get back with Sonny to do another variety series <laughs> where they truly and visibly hated each other as opposed to the bit they used to do where they sniped yes. at each other. They now they hated, hated each, each other, other, and you could see it. <laughs> Shields and Yarnell, 1977. Who doesn't love mimes? Everyone. <laughs> a married couple and mime performers. It actually became a hit and was brought back as a mid-season replacement that quickly died. I do remember that show as well. And as a result, the couple broke up and then never made it as solo acts. Yes, because, <laughs> again, mimes. Right. The Starland Vocal Band Show, 1977. Another one-hit wonder, Afternoon Delight. <laughs> Along with a few minor comedians you might have heard of, like David Letterman and Michael Keaton were both... 
bit players on this show. <laughs> Weren't they like writers who were sort of also writer forced writer to performers? Yeah. Perform. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's something I think you can actually find little bits on YouTube somewhere of this, <laughs> this just atrocious show, which had these two huge would soon be huge, huge performers. performers. So, with variety shows possibly making a comeback, because you've got Neil, Neil Patrick, Patrick Harris, Harris. Uh -huh. getting a show this fall. Yeah. Could shows like this be making a comeback? Uh, probably not. No. I don't think so. No. <laughs> and so, uh, if you do, you know, they do make a comeback, but you don't want to watch them instead, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>